and welcome everyone to today's local government education program entitled Understanding Illinois' Omnibus Election Reform Law. My name is Mike Delaney and I'm a community and economic development educator with the University of Illinois Extension. Today's webinar, webinar is a joint effort of the Illinois Association of County Board Members and the Illinois Association of County Clerks and Recorders together with the University of Illinois Extension. Allow me to begin uh, with a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first, I'll again note that we are recording today's session and we'll make it available to the public in a week or so. Next, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please muting your microphone so that we'll have uh, a good crisp sound quality for this recording. Um, as always, uh, you are welcome at any time to write questions that you might have into the Zoom chat space by clicking on the chat icon at the lower center of the Zoom screen. Uh, we'll take up the questions in a Q&A period following the presentation. I'll remind you that if you're having any, any problems connecting to the webinar, please identify those via the chat space as well, and someone will try to assist you. Finally, please remember that uh, at the conclusion of today's presentation, we will be sending an email with slides and a link to the recording to all registrants, registrants uh, for today's session. So I am now pleased to welcome to our virtual podium, uh, Kelly Murray. Kelly is the executive director of the Illinois Association of County Board Members and has served in that capacity for the association since 1997. I'd also like to welcome our panel of county recorders uh, representatives of county recorder's offices across the state. Uh, we have Julie Bliss the, from the county recorder's office in Boone County. We have Jessica Fox, uh, the county clerk for Shelby County. We have Don Gray, the county clerk for Sangamon County. And we have Brian Pollock, the deputy county clerk for Kane County. Uh, let me toss in Julie is the county clerk and recorder for Boone County, as I said at the beginning. So. Uh, with that, I will hand the microphone over to Kelly. Oh, good morning. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I want to just quickly thank the U of I Extension for partnering us uh, with us again today on today's uh, educational session. Um, while the 2020 legislative um, session was severely interrupted by the pandemic, the, the 2021 session um, with the adoption of some rule changes uh, provided more inclusive options to participate and provide testimony in committees. Mainly we were working uh, remote. But uh, however, despite these changes, it was still a challenging session and not normal by any means. Uh, from the onset of this legislative session, uh, elections and redistricting took precedence as a major issue facing lawmakers and also our local officials. Um, in addition, we had a long-awaited ethics package followed on the heels by electing a new Speaker of the House for the first time in 38 years. So overall, this was a really good session for local governments in Illinois in that no significant unfunded mandates or fund diversions were sent to the governor's desk. Um, the fiscal year 2022 budget package uh, totaled about $42.3 billion, I believe, and it held roughly flat. So. By adjournment, <clears throat> lawmakers had passed uh, well over maybe 640 bills. And uh, it's just important to note that probably 80, 85% of those were done in the final week of session. So it became uh, very hectic that final week. And in those final days, we saw um, lawmakers approve several important omnibus packages. This has kind of become the norm this last year and, and uh, probably a little bit in the preceding are these omnibus packages which seem to incorporate various individual pieces of legislation and rolling them into bigger, um, bigger packages for the lawmakers to consider and vote on. Among those uh, is Senate Bill 825, which is now the Public Act 10215, the elections omnibus package, which we will be discussing today. Governor Prisker signed the package into law on June 17th, uh, which among other provisions it establishes, you know, June 28, 2022 as the new general primary election date. 
Now, I think it's important to note that while the omnibus election reform measure was passed largely on a partisan basis and not necessarily supported by all county governments as well, it does make some reasonable changes, I think, to further expand access to the ballot box for seniors, individuals with disability, among many other changes. So also certain deadlines in the legislation are temporary. And, and many of those will revert back in 2023, which, which our presenters today will, will cover in detail. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica Fox. She's the president of the Illinois Association of County Clerks and Recorders to get us started. Jessica. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I appreciate being here today and um, glad that Julie, Dawn and Brian could join me as well. 2020 has certainly been a trying and challenging year for elections and I believe that county clerks have kind of proven that even in a pandemic we can and will provide whatever service necessary so that people can get out and cast their votes in a safe manner. Brian um, Pollock from Kane County was very involved in this legislation so I'm going to kind of hand the mic over to him and get this conversation started. So Brian. That's dangerous. <laughs> Jessica, you might want to. <laughs> so as um, as everyone's mentioned, yes, um, the the bill, the omnibus bill did kind of come together at the last minute. But that said, it wasn't something that we hadn't spent years working on some of these issues. When the bill dropped at about 2.30 in the morning on Memorial Day, uh, we were, many of us spent our Memorial Day holiday um, going through this, reading it, testifying, talking because um, we wanted to see, you know, the fruits of several years of our labor uh, get through. So while everything isn't exactly what we wanted, um, with, as with most bills that, you know, you later look back on as successful, um, <clears throat> some people are upset, some people are happy, but generally it's pretty much down the middle and um, pretty pretty satisfying with, with what could have been. So um, I guess we'll get started here. Um, Senate Bill 825 was signed by the governor, as I mentioned, on June 17th. Some of the major th issues that came out of it were um, increasing access to curbside voting, establishing a permanent vote by mail registry. That's been a big focus for us, and we were, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we we're happy that one got in. Um, establishing a central polling location in counties, so that's actually for the first time, the word vote center has, uh, is in state law. We'll talk about that. Strengthening cyber security standards for election authorities and providing viable voting opportunities for justice impaired, justice impacted individuals. Um, some of the changes of deadlines. Um, so as was mentioned, the primary was pushed back to June 28th uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them, dealt with redistricting, some of them dealt with, you know, uh, maybe some concerns about the pandemic, but, you know, um, the compromise was they're going to push the primary back to June 28th. So normally you, there are deadlines that we as election authorities know, and, and you as elected officials know, uh, 90 days out for vote by mail ballots, uh, 40 days out for early voting, uh, your petition period is a certain amount of days beforehand. Some of these things changed. It wasn't move the date to June and push everything back uniformly. So one of those dates is the, the time in which the, the nominating petitions can be circulated. Normally candidates have that full 90 day period to circulate petitions. In this case, the filing period, is, the circulation period is shorter. It was cut by about a third. So the first day that candidates who wish to file uh, in the primary, the June primary is January 13th. So normally you're used to circulating your petitions about a month from now, uh, at the end of August, or early September for that March primary. So instead the circulating period is gonna start January 13th. So it's gonna be a lot colder when you're out knocking on doors to get those signatures. The filing period begins on March 7th and ends on March 14th. So instead of the full 90 days, you're getting about two months. And as a result, the 
amount of signatures so that that normal requirement is uh, reduced by a third since the time period is reduced by a third. So in statute, it cut the state legislative and gubernatorial uh, signature periods. There's also a line there saying that everyone else who has to collect signatures, that number is going to be decreased by a third. So uh, you'll, as, as we get closer to that period, you know, generally your election authorities will, will let you know what those signature requirements are, and uh, we'll be calculating that and taking off a third of it. Some of the other things do stay similarly. The objection period follows, and you've got uh, the, the following week is for that. Um, the vote by mail period um, of when the ballots can be requested is about 90 days out. So we're pretty similar on that for at the end of uh, beginning at the end of March, uh, where the voters can request their ballots. Uh, one of the changes which we'll talk about will be the ability to request a permanent vote by mail ballot, which uh, we'll get to. Um, on the next slide, uh, the nominating period uh, where independent and new party candidates can circulate uh, will be in April. The certification uh, from the State Board of Elections to uh, the county clerks, uh, that'll be in April, April 21st. And then the, the date where a write-in candidate has to file that, um, that notarized declaration, that will be April 28th. Uh, May 14th is the date on which the first date which on which the election authorities can mail out the vote by mail applications. Um, early voting in person early voting begins May 19th and as we said election day is June 28th for the primary. And then the general election is going to stay the same in November and the, the certification date for the November election um, when we get the names of the candidates who qualify for the ballot will be in September. That's not too far off of the normal deadline. And as we mentioned, the statute mentions that these dates are only for the 2022 general election. Whether the legislature likes the June primary and they move forward with it, we don't know, but it's only for this election at this point. If they were to change it to June, they would probably tweak the deadlines back to where they normally are and giving the full 90 days to collect signatures, et cetera. But uh, for now, we know it's just for this period. And Brian, if I may add, just to add a little color to the calendar, it's important to keep in mind, that, oh, hold on, there you go. Oh, I was making sure I wasn't on mute. It's important to keep in, in what the, how the legislature was thoughtful in this approach to even though the season in which the administration of an election would take place in is different, that the actual timing for the authority in itself has the same time to be able to prepare and provide for the necessary voter services from vote by mail to early voting to election day that we would see in any normal cycle of election. So there isn't any condensed you know, portion of this that puts any kind of pressure or strain on the election authority to have to scramble or do something different to prepare. It's methodically laid out perfectly for us to be able to do our jobs well. And that's important because proper preparation and administration of development of ballots, testing ballots, equipment, all these other things that we've got to perform to provide for a secure and accountable election, an accurate election in the end, takes time and preparation. And we're not feeling any pressures of uncertainty that could have been if we were trying to perform this in our normal time of election and still had uncertainties about the various jurisdictions that would be new because of the reapportionment. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very comforted and my colleagues throughout the state are very comforted about this schedule and timing that you're gonna get from us the very best of what you should expect and our preparation our services and the execution of them for our voters throughout all the state of Illinois. It, it should offer itself another flawless moment. And I, and I think this, this calendar also offers a um, unique opportunity for, for a long period of time. There, there has been discussion you know, statewide about why do we always perform our primaries in wintertime where the weather and other elements are challenging for um, those that are interested in casting ballots, you know, thinking about the, the, you know, the importance of those that are casting ballots. And 
this now is a different season, a, you know, a summer season of casting ballots. It's going to be a unique experience to see what that does to participation, what that does to the attention of the electorate. And there's a real opportunity here, I think, uh, for the state of Illinois to kind of heed some new examples of how that participation can change because of us performing this election in a different season. So if you've been one of those before in the past, it's been critical about you know, uh, the bad weather and, and, and you know, the, the winter elections, you know, really heed the experience here of helping vote and increasing participation, because it, it really could uh, precipitate that for the future, you know, uh, in, in learning from what we get from this experience. I'll go back to Brian, if Brian wanted to keep moving forward. Oh, no, no. Thank you. Good points. Uh, it actually shifts the burden then of the bad weather from the voters to the candidates, because the candidates will be out collecting the signatures in the snow, rather than the voters going out and, and voting during, in the snow. So, yeah, yeah. And, and we, may, we may be able to see some some efficiencies in the petitioning process. You know, there's there's opportunities if you're within the same jurisdiction of, of an elected official that you can run a slate and you, know, you can circulate a slate. You know, there are certain parameters to that, you know, possibly because of the dynamics of, of this being a little you know, troublesome weather for candidates to get out and about, it could lead to, you know, working with and working more closely with your colleagues. For, exen for instance, you know, countywide elect officials of the same party, you know, they, they technically could circulate petitions together as a slate instead of independently all going out together. You know, that, that could speed up, you know, internally, you know, the review and the criticisms and the contests of you know these particular petitions, which could you know help move forward the administration process of this in a more timely fashion, and see more litigative factors happening, uh, you know about uh, entitlement of people properly doing the petitioning process. That that can get that can get us as the authority into a better position to 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 executing the election faster. So there, there there's lots of unique opportunities based on this new calendar. Very true. Any anyone else have any comments on um, on that, Jessica, Julie? Well, uh, the one thing that I thought was interesting too is the fact that they don't. Maybe I'm on mute. No, I should be okay. Um, that that people will be able to circulate, even though it's for a shorter amount of time. They have a shorter amount of signatures that they need to obtain, and um, I find it very interesting that with all these and these things that just a, a little timing is just the fact that county clerks are having to run for election next year too so um, a lot of these nuances and different things that we're going to find out where where your guinea pigs too one thing i kind of like about the moving the primary is while the weather will certainly be different and um you know just a reminder that your local election officials may want to make sure that their polling places are air conditioned, but that the fact that a lot of my election judges hopefully won't be in the Southern states, hopefully they will be local and be able to actually serve because we are always desperate for election judges every election. So hopefully this warm weather will help bring more people out on election day as well. And give us more students because the students will be out of school. True, yeah. Well, onto the exciting things like cybersecurity. Um, a couple things, the statute now mandates that every election authority have a website that utilizes a .gov web address. Uh, I believe the feeling here was that because there are so many uh, fears about, you know, what's the real thing, who's legit, whatever, if we have a .gov web address, you can people can feel comfortable knowing that if you go to cancountyelections.gov or sangamonelections.gov, you know that that's going to be the official site, not something that's you know spoofed. Um, so that'll help uh, instill some confidence in uh, where people are going to get their information, and it'll be something that you can uh, address with your constituents, let them know. The official site of your election authority is going to end in a .gov address. And then also the email addresses of staff also should have uh, that .gov address. 
a few other things. Uh, the statute went a little, uh, took a few other steps, although many election authorities are already doing these things. Um, we now have to perform an organizational risk assessment through the Cyber Navigator program on a biennial basis. Most election authorities already do that. I know our county participates. Um, it's part of the process to get the cybersecurity grant. Um, it's a program where the state's uh, cyber navigators, their, their IT staff comes out and does a vulnerability access and scan and, and looks through to make sure that um, you know, we're doing everything the right way and to make sure that our system is uh, safe and secure uh, to the best of, uh, of our knowledge and our abilities. So there are a few more things on there uh, on the slide that talk about what needs to be done. If you're a cyber geek, that's great uh, for the rest of us. We kind of do what our IT people tell us to do. Uh, the next idea, uh, next topic is the high school voter registration. Something that we, you know, we do, but it's something of the state uh, state legislature thought was very important and wanted to make sure that the state board is uh, getting more involved. Uh, a one page document will be sent out to high school age students to let them know that they are eligible to register to vote, how they can do it, and giving them the opportunity to, be, to prepare to register to vote if they haven't already done so or are eligible to do so. Um, and then there's some language about how no high school can prohibit nonpartisan registration. You can take reasonable uh, you know, steps, you, you know, maybe you're not giving them the, the stage every day, but, um, you know, if, if a group wants to, a nonpartisan group wants to come in to assist in voter registration, uh, they need to be able to, allowed to do that. So uh, we'll see if that causes problems or if it's going to uh, be a smooth process, but we can see the, where the legislature uh, wanted to go and uh, it's codified. So another instance where the state board is going to give guidance will be regarding, um, uh, the, so 90 days before an election, uh, the state board's supposed to be providing written guidance to election authorities about a few different issues. Uh, ballot tracking procedures would be one. Uh, so during the 2020 election, uh, many election authorities either contracted with third party vendors or developed their own system to track um, vote by mail ballots because one of the big calls you'd get from your voters you know I, I requested my ballot i got it did you get it back or when am i gonna get my ballot or what's going on so the nice thing about uh, about tracking procedure is the voter has the opportunity to sign up and um whether they want a text message or an email or a phone call acknowledging that their ballot was their their application was received then uh, their ballot was sent out and then their ballot was received back by the election authority. So the state board is going to give some guidance on those procedures. Uh, additionally, uh, summarizing requirements for curbside voting, uh, I guess voting in general, early voting and vote by mail. Because a lot of the um, election authorities, you know, we do have jurisdiction and, and control over how we run these systems as long as we're following state law. Um, you know, the, the permanent vote by mail list, which we'll talk about soon, uh, is new. So the state board will help give some guidance in this area to standardize some of the things while letting election authorities still have their internal control to be able to run the elections, um, you know, as they see fit. Uh, guys want to add in anything on those topics and how the state board may tell us what to do or what we've got to do? I'll go first if you like. You know, I, I think it's really important and it's critical moving forward that that Illinois and really election authorities throughout the nation are instilling practices that provide confidence to how we procedurally operate our voter services and voter registration alike. You know, that you know, educating, being transparent and accountable to procedurally how we operate is very important. And a, a big part of instilling confidence in the system is, you know, having real-time information, not lagging in information and proper ballot tracking, especially since we've seen a substantial, you know, increase based on the pandemic environment in the utilization of vote by mail is a real important part, you know, that people feel comfortable in knowing that how their ballot is being treated and where it is at in the process is you know accurate, legitimate, and done correctly, and that'll go a long way to kind of dispelling some of the narratives that we see that are out there that just are not true about the process. 
you know, the more that we can educate on, you know, how it really works and uh, show that, you know, have a tangible piece to show like a, like a ballot tracking system for, you know, example here in Sangamon County, you know, we, we take a multi-pronged approach. You know, you have the opportunity in real time online at any moment based on personal identification of yourself to, to look at the status of your ballot online, to, you know, through our, through our software uh, a package. And, you know, when you make a request, if you have a, if you have an email on hand, we, we send you a notification that we received your request, that the request has been accepted, that ballot has been mailed, that it's been returned back and that it's been accepted, you know, and uh, that, that goes a long way. And being able to find standardization of these forms of practices from one jurisdiction to the next is, is also going to provide more confidence, you know, from all the various different regions of the state. You know, we're, we're, we're a diverse, large state, and we have varying capability from from the northern to the central to the southern part of the state. You know, pointing out these best practices, laying them down through the State Board of Elections is gonna go a long way of being able to identify the piece that makes most sense for your jurisdiction, both in capability and cost, and providing a, a piece of that confidence like the remainder of all the other jurisdictions are doing. That's gonna be a necessary piece of the future for us, you know, in, in educating, dispelling, and providing confidence. And this is a very good piece uh, to, to, to propel us forward in doing that. Yeah, I know in um, Boone County for 2020, we it was great working with our voter registration vendor. Um, they were able to um, um, give the real time so anybody could go online. We have carried that through um, and have recently um, incorporated it into our new county website. Um, it, it gives a capability of reporting as well. So if somebody wants to have a different reports of these ballots that have been um, requested, they can see that. Um, but this definitely gives a very good um, transparent look into our procedures and what we're trying to move forward. And um, I, I noticed a question in the chat that was talking about the 90 day notice. Um, most counties after 2020 should already have a really good idea about what we need to be doing when it comes to this ballot tracking. Um, so I do feel like the, the State Board of Elections has plenty of time to give us that notification and for us to be able to carry it through. I also think there was a lot of confusion. And I think that that's one thing that people need to realize moving forward with elections is in November, you could start beginning, you could start requesting your vote by mail ballot August 1st. However, the election officials could not mail those ballots until September 25th. So I think that there was a lot of confusion um, amongst the voters about, hey, I requested it and I never got my ballot. Um, so hopefully, I think it's really important for all election officials as well to do a lot of um, PR work in their communities and make the voters aware of, hey, look, you know, these are the dates. This is the first date we can mail your ballot. And at any time, if anybody has any questions, you need to pick up the phone and call your election official and they'll be happy to answer any questions or concerns that you may have about you know, your vote by mail or, or voting in person, whatever. And last year we had the issues of, and, and we'll always have it because state law allows it, where while the election authority sends out for example, last year we had to mail out um, an application, a vote by mail application to certain voters that are that vote in general elections, and they got that from us. And you know, may, we may have had the the applications on our website, et cetera. But other third parties, whether they were political parties, whether they were candidates, whether they were nonpartisan organizations, sent out their own vote by mail ballot applications, and voters were confused in some senses. Well, why did I get two of them? Did I get, did I request two ballots? You know, um, while we sent out applications to only registered voters, third party groups may have used older voter lists where it may have sent a, an application, not a ballot, but an application to someone who had moved or someone who had died. So you as county board members um, may have gotten calls from your constituents. You may have reached out to us as election officials saying, hey, what's going on? You know, I got a call that, you know, so-and-so got a ballot and for her husband and he's been dead and why this happened. Well, no, it's not a ballot. It was an application. Um, so, 
as it was mentioned, we have to do make sure we're educating, you know, it's part of what we do as election authorities, but hopefully you also as our partners in this can educate your constituents as well. You, no one's getting multiple ballots. Only people who are registered voters are going to get a ballot, whether someone else mailed an application to you, unless you're a registered voter, you're not getting that ballot. So um, we need to continue on the education front, but you know, we can use your help in educating your constituents as well. I noticed another question somebody had requested um, what vendors we might use. Um, I know for Boone County, we used our voter registration vendor, which is Platinum Technologies. Um, they are the ones who um, put the ballot tracking um, in place for us and we'll conti we've continued to use that platform. We used ballot tracks. Um, we were working on developing our own uh, potentially, but we knew we were going to be um, inundated with them for the last election. So we went with um, an established uh, vendor. Okay, um, you can move on. The next slide uh, deals with, as we briefly mentioned before, that the general election date, November 8th, will be a state holiday, uh, as it was in 2020. We don't know if this is going to be something that will be codified going forward. Um, it would be nice to know from an election authority point of view, whether election day is going to be a holiday in the future. Schools are the issue. Um, Yes, it's great that schools will be an option for polling places in November and also with a later primary, but for other elections, we don't have that knowledge. Uh, if the primary goes back to March, kids are in school in March. You know, sometimes it's spring break, but generally kids are in school. If election day is not a holiday in November, then kids are in school. And for the consolidated election in April and for those of us that often have a consolidated primary in those odd numbered years in February, kids are in school. So it's, it's hard, election authorities want consistency and some schools don't want to be polling places. You know, whether they have to be or not, they don't want to be. And you don't want to work with an election authority that a uh, polling place that doesn't want to be a polling place. So we've looked for stability uh, and consistency. We'll see if that goes forward. But in this election, November 8th will be a state holiday. So uh, schools be closed. We'll have more opportunities for, for students and hopefully some teachers and staff to be election judges as well. Uh, the biggie, oh, sorry. It, it, Brian points out the consistency, right? So this, this also applies for voters themselves. You know, we, we wanna have consistency from election to election, especially when it refers to election day and your polling location. You know, um, most often, you know, the individual voter who votes on election day is accustomed to going to the same neighborhood polling place for decades. And when we're making changes from one election to the next based on av availability of a school, it just leads to more confusion and more questions. You know, sometimes that word doesn't get out enough and they don't know that a change has been made. You know, it, it could actually work against the individual trying to cast their ballot to do it in a more timely fashion. So like, like Brian was referring to, you know, if, if, if election day is to lot it itself a holiday for schools for every election moving forward, that is a great administrative asset to the election authority because schools naturally present themselves more opportunity for space, space in an interesting new environment like COVID that we probably will have to think about for years where, you know, we want to have more space in between our equipment for people's health. Um, space in terms of parking and availability for more voters to come to a, a polling place. Um, so those, those are all great benefits and they're easily identifiable, right? You can articulate a school in a community and, and uh, mostly people know where that's at. But if it's not available in consistency from one election to the next, from you know, your, your even years, you know, gold standard elections to your odd years, consolidated elections, local government elections, 
it adds just layers of confusion of moving from one location to the next. And we don't want that. We want consistency in voters knowing exactly where to go, where it is that they need to cast their ballot. And the state holiday, look, I'm from Sangamon. It's been a state holiday for, for state workers, you know, for years. And it, it'll be interesting to see how this, um, this experiment, uh, again, treats itself on participation. There's lots of arguments about this, and now we're collecting more data about it. You know, you know when, when schools are out and you're off from the day of work, you've got to take care of your children and think about what's happening in the uniqueness of that day. Does that work against your opportunities of getting to the polls, or does it enhance it? Or does it enhance it in a sense that now your children can join you and learn about the democratic process and the electoral process and come cast a ballot with you? I think time's going to tell to see you know, how it affects Administratively, I don't, I don't think it affects us much at all, you know, if, if, if people are off and, and not having to, you know, be part of the workday and just have the opportunity to go out and vote and put more focus on it. But uh, from a participation standpoint, I, I think the data is going to drive if that's going to be a permanent piece for us of the future or not. To expand just slightly on um, Don's point and Brian's point about um, consistency. When we do have to make changes to our polling locations, we're required to notify those voters. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, you know, can not only cause confusion, but it's also an expense. And that's something that we have to consider as well when we're having to change them from year to year. Yeah, and there's criticisms to it, right, too. You know, so some of the big things you hear about is you know, the rapid change in election operations on an election day could be considered suppressive. You know, so, you know, we never want to be accused of that either. You know, so we, you know, we, we've got to keep that conformity, you know, consistency and standardization of the elements of how we perform an election day, because it's just best across the board in, in people's core knowledge and knowing exactly how it operates on election day from year to year to year. And I think one, another thing that people have to keep in mind is election day for you is just that it's election day for election officials. It's a year round, almost never ending process because there's planning, there's um, making sure your voter rolls are up to date, scheduling election judges, finding election judges, finding polling places, if that be the case. So for your election official, an, an election is many months of planning. So, and I, and I think that that's a lot of things that voters don't understand. It's not just that day and over, it's um, months before and several weeks after. Good point. And maybe this is a good point, uh, a good time to bring it up. While there, you know, you see a lot of things on the news about people questioning, you know, results, questioning processes. Um, yes, it's, it, it was, it's pretty much, we're, we're doing this year round. And at times, we're dealing with multiple elections. As we were finishing up the, the November election, we were getting ready for it. We had a consolidated primary in February and a consolidated election in April. We were dealing with three elections at once. Um, so it, it's not just turning on a switch on election day. You know, we've got 291 precincts and we've got to get all those planes up in the air and get them landed and get them, get everything done. And it just, just doesn't happen on one day. But I, the other point I want to make, um, our election workers, our election judges, um, they put in yeoman's work in this last election yeah, it was hard to find some of them. Um, we appreciate their service and, and they really are the keys to these elections. We were planning, we're doing all this work, but it's, it's those citizens, those, I mean, yes, they get paid, but it's a long day. They're, they're slightly more than volunteers and they're, they're working hard prior to the election and on election day and, and making sure that we land that plane. So thank you to all the election workers, the election judges, whatever you guys call them, for the work that they did in helping us get through this election and every election that we do. And I just saw a question um, from Representative Calkins um, about ending early voting on Friday. I would say that would be the weekend before the November election. I have a staff of three plus myself we saw an unprecedented early voter turnout and um, the weekend before the election, our voter turnout was unbelievable. So while I would not wanna do anything to disenfranchise any voter, ending early voting on Friday before the election, oh wow, it would be, it would be a huge help because we're trying to deliver equipment, 
we're trying to have Saturday voting hours, plus delivering equipment again on Monday and preparing for Tuesday election. Um, that's a great idea. It would be a huge help. And also, um, we are required or have been required in the past that weekend before the election to also conduct in-person voting in those um, nursing facilities that request them, those long-term care facilities. Now, a lot of us have worked around that the past several years just because of the COVID, well, the last year because of the pandemic. But that's also something else that's thrown on our plate that um, weekend prior to the election. So maybe considering ending early voting on Friday would be great. It seems around here that the, the Monday before the election, the lines for early voting are, are crazy. I mean, even this election was even, it was even crazier, but it's almost like people don't realize, oh, I've had 39 days where I could have gone to early vote. And then all of a sudden, oh, I, I, I have to vote today because I don't want to wait in line on election day. Sometimes those lines are longer on Monday than they are on Tuesday. But um, it's just a annual thing. Um, so moving on to the, the permanent vote by mail status. This is something that um, we actually drafted this a few years ago. Um, and we've had discussions with legislators for a while. Some of those discussions were um, obviously less in person this year because of, of COVID or the last two years because of COVID. And um, we kept working and working on it. And then we, we weren't sure if it was going to be, well, we weren't even sure that there was gonna be an omnibus bill until the last minute. And uh, but we were told if it happens, it's will be in there. Um, but the funny thing is we, we wrote this a few years ago and um, we, we didn't plan for the first election to be a primary. That was actually, the point was, we kind of wanted to have a soft landing on this for a general election and not have to deal with um, how we handle a primary. But uh, it is what it is. So what the permanent vote by mail status says is that a voter can apply for a vote by mail ballot, not just for one election, but for multiple elections. So um, we noticed anecdotally that some voters who voted by mail in last November uh, expected that they'd be able to vote by mail in the consolidated election. Even though historically the law has been that you have to sign up for a ballot for every election, uh, we think that did push down some of the turnout in the consolidated. We'll see how that happens in the future. But the new law allows that when a voter applies for a vote by mail ballot, they'll have the option to request a ballot for each election going forward. So that if that voter vote, uh, wants to vote by mail in the, I was about to say March primary, in the June primary, uh, they'll also be able to vote by mail in the November general election, the April consolidated election, et cetera. Um, so just want to say again that only registered voters can receive a vote by mail ballot. You know, all of us have our voter registration systems. So if, you know, Joe Smith sends in an application and Joe Smith's not a registered voter at that address, Joe Smith is not getting a ballot. We're not just mailing ballots to random people. Um, just want to make sure that we're all aware of that situation. Um, the next slide mentions that um, election authorities must notify all qualified voters uh, between 45 to 90 days before a general election. So we read that as not just this 2022 general election, but all general elections going forward um, of the option to vote by, uh, to, to, have the, to join the permanent vote by mail status. The statute specif specifies the language, you may apply to be permanently placed on a vote by mail status using the attached application. So as a county board member, when you're doing your budgets, what that means is we're going to have, we have a mandate that we're gonna to have to send out this notification to all our qualified voters. So there will be an expense that goes to mailing that, um, that letter and that application to our voters. Uh, we're hopeful that the state board of elections will find some money for us in the budget. Um, but at this point, it is a mandate and it is unfunded. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we didn't, we planned this a few years ago and we weren't expecting the first election uh, where the vote by mail, permanent vote by mail status would happen in a, in a primary. So um, 
the statute also mentions that we will have the we must give the opportunity for voters to change their vote by mail their party status from election to election well an interesting side note the other states that have a permanent vote by mail list or are all mail um require party registration so in illinois um you can be a republican all your life and decide i want to vote in the democratic primary this time or vice versa or never have voted in a primary before but there's a race that you're interested in, you know, you want to pick, uh, you know, whether it's a local person or, you know, you want to be involved in a presidential primary, you never have been. So we don't require that registration ahead of time. So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to figure out how we're going to handle that first round of ballots. Um, you know, are you getting the, the ballot for the party you voted in forever? Is it a request? How are we handling the changes? But the nice thing is the legislature gives the, the authority to us as election authorities to be able to figure out the best way to handle those things. And rest assured, you know, there are four election authorities here. We're all involved in the Association of County Clerks and Recorders. We talk about these things. We look at best practices here and throughout the country. So um, we'll, we'll make sure, we'll do our best to get it right. So um, this, is, this is kind of the first step in a longer process maybe or it's just the opportunity to give people a little bit more consistency in their voting methods. But ultimately, um, it's an opportunity for voters to have the opportunity to vote in the way that they see fit and the way that they feel most comfortable. And as election authorities, we want everyone to vote and we wanna find ways to give them the best opportunity to vote. So with that, I'll back off and let you guys comment. Yeah, so I, I, I think there's really great opportunity in this. And I wish this would have been what the legislature focused on first when we moved into the COVID environment. Because we knew because of COVID that vote by mail was going to organically grow anyway for a certain demographic of voters, specifically those that are much older, right? More on their senior status. Um, and what we did was just send out, you know, they defined a certain parameter based on those who would request the ballots before in the past and, and those that are registered within your jurisdiction and you know who cast ballots and who made an application in your jurisdiction. And we automatically just sent out applications saying, this exists out here, use it if you'd like to use it, right? And that's kind of confusing. It's not very well defined on why it's happening and it came from multiple different angles. So organically allowing for a program where you application in and knowing that you always want to be able to vote by mail offers the opportunity for the election authority to actually keep that list and hold it so much more accountable. You can see in the law, it, it, allow, it, it, it requires us to have to notify in advance by mail that you're a part of this program, that uh, if you want to be a part of this program, that you are a part of this program, Sangamon County will do that because it then allows us to confirm and, and, and ensure that you made the request, that you are still living at the address of which you made the request from. You know, so often people make changes of their address and don't change their voter registration. This is very similar to the voter registration database where we're mandated to have to mail and confirm uh, voters uh, every two years to the status of them living at the address of the voter registration. If they're not, it starts a process of suspension to cancellation. That's the potential in this form of a permanent list of those requesting ballots, because we can articulate to it. We can see it in more real time if the person is still you know, uh, validly living and, and registered at that address to receive their ballot. So instead of just applications coming out of nowhere, out of many different angles, on paper, electronic, coming from parties, third parties, candidates, et cetera, by mail, you know, this list, this list is core. We can keep it accountable and we can make sure that it's done right. And if we do that as an administration, it's going to lead to efficiencies of savings. We're going to be able to pre pre prepare much more long term and knowing there's not uncertainty the amount of what we have to prepare for in, in vote by mail. Uh, there's not an uncertainty uh, of, of, of what our expense is going to be. So this is going to be really interesting to see how it goes. I think this is the proper framework for properly providing services, holding accountable and being transparent. And um, I'm, I'm excited to see how this is gonna work out well for specifically Sangamon County, where we're gonna put a substantial marketing campaign behind this uh, to really educate the public of its benefits and, and how you should have confidence in it and the things that we're doing to hold it accountable. 
and we'll see what what happens as time goes on. Like like Ryan referred to this, this could be you know that that game changer of seeing an evolution of our voter services to being more sparsed out between you know mail, early voting, and election day. No longer just a single day of election. You know, it's an election period of what's transitioning and happening. And measures like this are going to allow us to hold it much more accountable. Brian, I'm going to jump in here uh, and note that we've uh, got about eight minutes left in the scheduled time and a few more topics and slides to cover. So just wanted to make, I, I know all the speakers have uh, suggested that they'll be available uh, if we spill over, but just wanted to make everybody aware of uh, the time. You get a bunch of county crooks together, we'll keep talking, that's for sure. So thanks for keeping us <laughs> Uh, and we, we, we appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I did notice in the chat, somebody had mentioned something about making sure that um, keeping the voter rolls are updated. If that's important, that is a daily task for us. This is not something that we just do when it when it's a time for us to send ballots out or, um, or, or anything. This is daily that we are keeping up and investigating on whether someone still lives at that address or a new registration or a canceled registration or, or we've been notified that somebody has moved. That's a huge part of our daily job, but that also is a responsibility to the registered voter to make sure that they're taking care of that as well. And I think that's something that probably as clerks that we need to do and engaging our registered voters and making sure that they understand that. We may not be notified right away that someone has passed away, especially if it's not um, locally. Um, so it, it's very important that um, we're something that you as the elected officials also can help us in, in educating um, our folks that if you know somebody has moved, if you know somebody has passed away to encourage their family or encourage them to let us know um, of their change in status so that we can stay on top of that um, as much as we possibly can. That's, it's extremely important. But again, it's, it's a daily process. It's not just once or twice a year. Hey, Brian, why don't you summarize the remaining slides and then we'll see if anyone's got specific questions for us. Okay, so the, the next slide deals with uh, accommodations for disabled voters for vote by mail. There was a process that the state board had in the last election where election authorities had the opportunity to um, participate. And if voters needed that assistance, there was a program. Uh, the law just says that the state board must prepare and submit to the General Assembly some legislation about how they're gonna deal with this permanently. Uh, curbside voting is something that uh, me, uh, some election authorities have done already. Uh, it just gives the opportunity for those election authorities to provide curbside voting for certain voters. And just like any other process, you'd have election judges overseeing the process. So if, if a county, an election authority does engage and offer curbside voting, two judges, one from each party, uh, would, be able, would be required to go out to assist that voter and um, uh, have them participate in the process. Um, the next slide deals with uh, the option for a county sheriff to establish a temporary branch polling place at the county jail. Cook County was required to do that by statute previously. Um, now all counties have the option. Uh, generally, most election authorities provide vote by mail ballots to um, those. Uh, and just to specify, it's not, it's people who are in custody but have not been convicted so uh, uh people have the right to vote uh prior to uh that conviction if they're in uh in custody at that point so this would uh, allow an election authority to establish a branch in conjunction with the sheriff's office uh but there's no requirement vote centers um i mentioned it don mentioned it this could be the opening of something big this could be um uh could transform the way we do elections. But briefly, the requirement right now is uh, similar to something we had in 2020. Every election authority must have one, or at least one, depending on how you read this, um, polling place, whether it's uh, most likely will be at the county clerk's office or the, the home side of the election authority, but one polling place where anyone can vote on election day, no matter where they live in the county. Uh, it's very similar to what most jurisdictions do with early voting, uh, where it's universal, where 
if you live in the north side of the county and you show up to vote at an early voting site on the south side, you can do it. So this vote center, and that, that word is used for the first time, it's something that election authorities have been talking about and other states have. Um, but in Illinois, every election authority must have at least one vote center that's open for everyone in the county to be able to vote. If you happen to be in that area, you change your registration, whatever, it's a central voting place. Um, this may be the opening to having them throughout the county uh, or throughout the election authority. And um, if there's a shift to more people voting by mail because of the permanent list, as well as more early voting um, because of convenience, because of a pandemic or whatever the situation is, um, you may start having less of a less foot traffic on election day less of a need for all of the neighborhood local polling places and vote centers may be a thing. Um, you, if you wanna look, Colorado is probably a, a model that um, some states are looking towards where uh, you have a majority of your voters who vote in-person early voting or voting by mail and then having those vote centers, having maybe less vote centers on election day, but being able to open that up where anyone can vote at those sites on election day. So uh, this may be the start of something else, but right now it requires us as election authorities to have at least one in the county. I'll see, anyone else have some comments on that? Yeah, you know, the large county to medium-sized counties have been doing this for years. You know, we were mandated at a certain population level. They have to provide for at least one. And this is now opening up the opportunity, you know, for more of the smaller sized county can brings that standardization across the board. And, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see what comes of it. You know, it, it, you know, there, you know, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, the thoughts of the court and the election authority, you know, there's varying different thoughts about how vote centers can be applied. You know, it, it really comes down to kind of a, you know, a, a demographic of age, you know, you know, you have older voters that are most inclined to really want to have a neighborhood location you know, and, and younger voters that, you know, are much more fluid and transient where, you know, they, they just want to know whether the next available location for them to be able to cast the ballots at. So this, this kind of offers, you know, the bridge to that capability of being, you know, multi-purpose for greater participation, you know, and kind of, kind of, you know, geographically low areas of you know particular county and it could potentially be administrative cost savings down the road where we've got less uh, facilities less you know of workers larger locations where ballots still being cast and it's being done right so time will tell if this it takes hold in illinois and you know there's certainly been a good model of success of other states that have done this i know for boone for being a smaller county we still print our poll books for each precinct um, so for us, we will keep it at the election authority or the county clerk's office, my office, um, just I think that we'll have an easier time of administering that. Um, but it would be interesting to see if some of the smaller counties, if we were able to have more than one, if that may change the process and whether they're printing their poll books or having an electronic poll book where they might be able to access all the precincts in one, in one location. So that'll be interesting to see how that affects that as well. Shelby County also prints our poll books and, um, you know, we only offer the vote center in Shelbyville, but I tell you what, we, we do have a really good turnout, um, even on election day, um, with voters coming here to vote instead of going to the precinct. Our, our voters, you know, elderly rural locations, they're used to their, you know, little local precinct. So I think that if this is something that we did transition to in the future, it would take maybe a little time to change people's ways. But I do think it could definitely be a cost savings for the smaller counties to be able to offer vote centers throughout the county instead of just one location, instead of having individual um, precinct polling places. And, and we'll see obviously how that works uh, as the numbers for early voting and, and um, vote by mail change. From a, from a county perspective, as, as you as county board members, if this had come in a few years ago, uh, it might've been a little bit more helpful for those of us that are planning and looking at new equipment because there's a big difference if we're buying for 
the, the number of polling places we have now versus if we were to have, you know, a smaller amount of vote centers. That administrative savings that we're talking about uh, certainly comes into play when you're talking about buying voting equipment. And with federal money out there, uh, you know, this is a time, but we're kind of in limbo. So, um, but something to think about at budget time. Last couple slides, uh, reapportionment. We had drafted language to give counties more flexibility because as you know, you have to do your, your reapportionment and until the law changed, you had to have it done in July. And, um, but with the pushing back of the, the election, it, it provided some relief to election authorities to not have to um, rush the process of, I mean, there's so much that we have to do in, in a reapportionment year um, to get ready for an election. And with the election moving back several months that it provided relief for everyone. So uh, this is kind of a moot point. Uh, with regard to the municipal restrictions, there was actually a law drafted for one state rep who was uh, who ran for mayor of his town, and there had been some uh, some rules uh, referendum uh, that had been drafted to keep him from running for mayor. Anyway, he got elected, and this is just a retroactive thing to clean up his ability to be the mayor of the town and be a state rep. Um, the this actually isn't really an election thing, but the law did uh, change the start date for the sheriff to December 1st. And that those are the biggies on this. So um, I think if there are questions that haven't been answered yet, this is probably the time to do so, so. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. That was a lot of information. And uh, there are a number of questions. We're not lacking for questions today. Uh, let me just go back to the uh, through the uh, questions. We one early question uh, applying to the uh, timing uh, and quantity. Uh, someone asked, uh, "Does one third less signatures apply to referenda?" Good question. And if that's beyond our can or needs uh, more specific research, we can uh, table that one. And uh, it, one thing to uh, remind everybody of is if, with respect to any additional questions, please remember that you will have the presenter's contact information if you'd like to email them directly with whatever questions might uh, occur to you after the fact. And those are good questions because uh, we may need a trailer bill to clean up some of these things. So if you find there are questions or we find holes, this is certainly the time to bring it up before veto session. Um, let's go to the next question. If the, um, if the district maps are challenged and challenged successfully, how will that affect eventually affect the timing of the primary? Well, we're hoping that it won't, and, and that's what helped participate or precipitate this change, you know, in the calendar. So, uh, you know, kind of built into the thinking was, A, we needed more core data, the actual census data itself. The congressional maps uh, weren't going to be drafted without it. You know, they made it clear that those were going to wait. You know, the, the county governments really couldn't move along with doing their maps because it wasn't specific enough of what we were using in, in the data to get down to that level. So, you know, the, the, the judicial court case pieces that we see relative to the map that the legislature passed is already in full swing. You know, who knows if they're gonna come back when, once we receive the census data and, and, and make adjustments uh, from that. So that's all kind of moving already. And it was thought into the process thinking of why, you know, administratively we needed more time in the calendar for an election. do a couple of things at once. I'm going to ask Nancy to put up a poll uh, as we're approaching the end of our time. Uh, just a quick question, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if our attendees wouldn't mind, uh, as we continue with a few more questions, uh, also taking a second to answer the poll. We'd appreciate it. Um, okay, with respect to the uh, cybersecurity uh, question has been posed, just how confident can we be uh, if our attorney general can be hacked? How secure is a .gov website? And that may be beyond the can of. Uh... 
Well, I think one thing that um, is good to know, you do have to prove that you are a government. So we are going to be, um, when you have that, you can rest assured that that, that government has already proven that they're a government and can have it. However, I I'm not sure that we're, um, we're, you're only as good as your IT department can be. We'll put it that way. And, and Illinois has made a substantial investment in cybersecurity and as critical infrastructure that election operations is, you know, it's taken serious. The, the measures put in place have been successful. That is a, an, another daily piece of vigilance. And we'll, we'll continue to be at the forefront of staying out in front of our opponents. The that gov piece is really more of a piece on the disinformation side. It's knowing that you're a trusted official and that this is a place that you can go to for good, credible information. All election authorities have ballot tracking. I didn't hear the first part of the question. Can you say it again? Will Will all election authorities have ballot tracking? It's a, it's a good question. You know, uh, I, I think that they should have. You know, I, I, certainly as we meet as colleagues, it's it's a priority for all of us. Mm -hmm. It does come down to you know resources and opportunity and expense. Uh, but at a minimum level, I think every jurisdiction is providing, you know, some sort of, you know, real time opportunity to, to be able to know, even if it's just a simple phone call. But, you know, again, it's those pieces that's going to provide the confidence of the future that, you know, vote by mail has been is being done correctly and that you can have confidence that's done right. Um. There's a whole cluster of questions uh, with respect to the permanent lists. Uh, when does that permanent list start? Uh, each county chooses when. Um, for the permanent list, do the voters choose which election types, primary, general, or consolidated where they get ballots? Does this Anybody start? want to jump in? Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a conversation with my local state rep about this because I guess I'm an oddball, so to speak. And I kind of thought that the permanent vote by mail list would allow us to automatically send an application, not automatically send a ballot. So, um, I'm kind of looking forward to how this proceeds, but my understanding is, you know, this is gonna start in June. The, the voters will have the opportunity to sign up for the permanent vote by mail list. I just think that there's gonna to have to be some things worked out in the legislature about whether they are going to automatically get an application for a ballot or whether they're going to automatically get the ballot. So I there's certainly going to be an, an educational piece of this, and I think it's going to take time to properly roll something like this out with confidence. So same as taking an approach that, you know, we don't, want, we don't want to get out too early, too far and away from the election where people aren't really kind of thinking about election administration yet. But we certainly want to give ourselves enough time to properly explain what's the opportunity and how it could potentially benefit you. And it's a secure, accountable piece to election services. So, you know, we're thinking sometime after the first of the year that we'll officially launch this and we'll allow our registered voters in Sangamon County to start to enroll themselves into a permanent list of vote by mail. And, you know, Jessica's right. You know, it, this is going to be a little bit of, you know, see what works and kind of get going and see what unexpected challenges and consequences come from it and adapt. So, uh, but collectively know that all county clerks statewide, the legislature, you know, and the state board of elections are going to be working and, and, and together to make sure that this goes well. Thank you. Will the permanent list be available to the public? What? Great question. I don't know that, you know, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I would think that it would have to be, you know, uh, um, we know that it would be available to candidates. Uh, it's probably not available for commercial purpose, but you know, again, if, if, if the goal is transparency and accountability, we want the public to see it. 
finally, does, does it start with the primary in 2022 or and then the general in 2022 as well? I well, believe we that's how it's written. Right. And we have to notify, we have to send our notification out to every qualified voter. It, to me, reading it, it sounds like it's, it would be before the general election, not the general primary. But we have the option to allow people to go ahead and join that list prior, but we'll actually be sending a notification out to all of our voters um, then after uh, the general primary. Thank you. Well, listen, we've uh, held you over. Uh, there are more questions, but uh, we want to be mindful of everybody, everybody's time and particularly yours. Um, I, I will again remind everybody that uh, you will have the uh, contact information for our panelists uh, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to email them directly with these questions if you'd like clarification uh, or uh, perhaps provide some input and suggestions. Um, thank you for your responses to the poll questions. We appreciate that. Uh, at this point, I'd like to say that on behalf of the University of Illinois Extension, uh, I'd like to thank all of you, our panelists, for taking your time today to join us and providing us with this very informative insight onto what could otherwise be a kind of a, a far-reaching and confusing bill. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for our attendees, you'll be receiving presentation materials and a link to this recording for this webinar in a follow-up email. Uh, also, you can register to, or please visit our website to register for future webinars uh, with all kinds of interesting topics. Uh, that's at go.illinois.edu slash LGE. And finally, we wanna thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. Uh, please have a great day and we hope to see you back for future presentations. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having Thank you. us.